Ganon. He's been the big bad of Hyrule ever since the Zelda franchise began. He's a cold, calculating, intimidating adversary. At least he was until Breath of the Wild came along. Of course Breath of the Wild is a fantastic game, beautiful open world, felt like a kid again, blah blah blah. But you didn't come here to listen to that. You came here for the complaining. And I have a few complaints about Ganon in Breath of the Wild, so here we go. One of the strengths of the Zelda series has always been its baddies. Since Ocarina of Time released in 1998, pretty much every 3D Zelda game has had a compelling and intimidating antagonist. Not necessarily a character with a great deal of depth, but one with clear motivations, who feels like a genuine threat. It's unfortunate then, that this core element of the series didn't make its way into Breath of the Wild. Here are, as I see it, the main issues with Ganon in his current form, and what I hope Nintendo will do to address them in Tears of the Kingdom. For the purposes of this video, and to keep things simple, I'll be referring to all portrayals of Ganondorf and the Beast Ganon as Ganon. Time for a quiz. Which one of these is Fire Blight Ganon, the Death Mountain Divine Beast boss? That's right, all four of these pictures are practically indistinguishable. But seriously though, unless you're on New Game Plus 19, you might find it difficult to tell at a glance which of these four Ganons is which. Unfortunately, they lack any real visual distinctiveness. This is a wider problem in Breath of the Wild. As you probably know by now, the game has no dungeons in the traditional Zelda sense. Instead, we have shrines, which all have the same visual aesthetic, and the four divine beasts, which all have the same visual aesthetic. The four Ganons are likewise very similar in appearance. This is a huge departure for the Zelda series, in which distinctive dungeons and enemies have always been a core component. In contrast to earlier Zelda games, Breath of the Wild puts player freedom above all else. The player can go where they want, when they want, and tackle any boss in any order. This isn't a bad design choice per se, but I think it has contributed to the lack of distinctiveness in the dungeons and bosses of the game. Dungeons and bosses have to be beatable in any order, which means they can't rely on the key item-based progression of earlier games. This makes everything in Breath of the Wild feel more homogenous, copy-pasted rather than painstakingly designed. The bosses just aren't particularly memorable. Breath of the Wild Ganon epitomizes this change in design philosophy. When he takes over Hyrule, he has to inhabit divine beasts and other tech to do it. Even when he materializes to fight Link, he looks like he's been jumbled together from bits of divine beast. I'm guessing this is to continue the theme of Ganon turning the Hylians' technology against them, but it kind of reinforces the idea that Ganon isn't a real threat, making it look like he has to borrow spare parts to even put up a fight. All of this adds to the feeling of anonymity that Ganon gives off in this game. Let's pick an example fight for comparison. Girahim from Skyward Sword. The first time you fight this guy, you're not ready. In fact, Girahim uses this fight to literally teach you a lesson, instructing you on how best to try and defeat him. He's aloof and patronizing, and you feel completely out of your depth. You're just a diversion to him, a plaything. This is a great first fight with the main antagonist because it sets up Girahim as an intimidating threat. You're not ready to beat this guy. You know it, and he definitely knows it. What do we learn about the personality of Ganon from encountering him in the Divine Beasts? Uh, he's... purple? Kind of? These fights really tell us nothing except, ooh, it's the baddie. Which is fine once, but five times is a bit of a stretch. When Link finally meets Ganon in Ocarina of Time, it's a brilliantly tense moment. Your child Link, facing off against an enemy far bigger and stronger than you. Even though it's just a short cutscene, we actually learn a lot about Ganon in these two minutes. His personality, his selfish ambition, that he's aggressive and dangerous. A scene like this is exactly what Breath of the Wild is missing. Breath of the Wild's Ganon has no personality, no motivations. He's just a gas cloud, more of an environmental hazard than a nemesis. During Ganon's introduction, he's essentially framed as an elemental evil, one that has always existed, and will apparently always return in some form. Not the greatest pep talk for Link at the start of the game. But compare this to previous Ganons, who had a personality and motivations, who got angry, or were greedy, or sometimes even regretted choices they'd made. None of this nuance is present in current Zelda, and the fact that Ganon is just some purple sludge that inhabits other people's creations is symptomatic of this problem. Trailers for Tears of the Kingdom have hinted that the game will be returning to an older style of Ganon, assuming he's the villain here, even giving him a voice. 
so perhaps Nintendo also feel the need for Ganon's character to change course, I don't know. But if they're returning to a more traditional style of villain for the series, I think that's a good move. When Link wakes up and returns to Hyrule, he finds the people living relatively peaceful lives. Breath of the Wild Hyrule doesn't look particularly oppressed. Yes, there's a big monster in the middle of the map, and yes, certain areas are particularly dangerous for travellers. But in the towns and villages, most of the people seem to be living their normal, peaceful lives, with little sense of urgency that they're about to be nuked by a giant divine beast. The beasts are an inconvenience at worst, not significant threats to anyone. In Ocarina of Time, travelling to future Hyrule is one of the most striking moments in the game. You materialise in the Temple of Time as a young man to find that Hyrule has been transformed. The town is destroyed. Ganon's lackey has taken over the stables. The Kokiri forest is overrun with monsters. Very few places feel safe. All of this serves to heighten the sense of threat that Ganon poses to the player. If he can do all this just by ascending to the throne, he must be a force to be reckoned with. Breath of the Wild Hyrule should be a Terminator-style post-apocalypse, where the people are in a desperate struggle to survive and resources are scarce. Instead, Ganon is such a distant threat that you've got time to go off and gather 700 turds if you want before you fight him. While I appreciate that Ganon is being restrained in some way by Princess Zelda, he still has control of all the Guardians and the Divine Beasts when the game begins. Why not use this power to hunt down Hylians and destroy their settlements? Surely Ganon, an unstoppable force hell-bent on destroying the world, wouldn't just… stop? What's he waiting for? Even Impa seems pretty chilled about the situation, reminding you that the endless cycle of Ganon being banished and coming back has been going on for at least 10,000 years, so you know, might as well stock up on turds. <coughs> to be fair to Breath of the Wild, this is a problem that most open world games have. There just isn't enough of a sense of urgency about the main quest. It's possible to use this to your advantage, however. The Elder Scrolls Morrowind has a very similar premise. The big bad waits for you in a dungeon at the centre of the map, and you have to quest and level up to get ready to face him. But Morrowind asks you to navigate the various political factions of its game world, to quest for artefacts of power, make alliances with local leaders, all in a bid to unite an entire province behind you as leader. And that game's antagonist, Dagoth Ur, had his own plans to turn the people of Morrowind to his side. All of this plays out over a 30-hour campaign that, while never action-packed like Breath of the Wild, is certainly very compelling. And yes, I get that these are two very different games. Zelda has never been a Dungeons & Dragons inspired RPG, but I do think Nintendo could ratchet up the tension in their story, without losing the sense of freeform exploration that Breath of the Wild does so well. Ganon's complacency just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. He's already powerful, he already holds all the cards, there are no political or environmental factors that would stop him from carrying out his evil plan. He just… he'll get around to it, you know? This afternoon, maybe. In case it's not clear, I think Breath of the Wild is a fantastic game, but its generic antagonist, who appears to have no motivation, is a big letdown for me. I'm hopeful that Tears of the Kingdom can turn this around and give us someone more compelling to face down in that game's final act. And we'll find out soon, it's only a month from release as I record this. If you'd like to see my reaction and review when Tears of the Kingdom drops, consider subscribing. Finally, here's to the real final boss of Breath of the Wild. Hit the like if you like, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.